<clears throat> well, hello again, everybody. I just filmed a video earlier today on financial advice, and it's now after dinner, and I thought I was going to edit it, but instead I'm feeling inspired to film another video, so we'll see how that goes. You may have noticed, uh, I'm not sure which order I'm going to post these in, but earlier for the financial advice video, I did it against the white background. I didn't think this background would work with the red shirt, but then I thought maybe the white contrast against my pasty white skin wasn't so hot either, so I don't know, I'm still messing around with the background and the lighting. I think I've moved up from maybe a C- minus to a B- minus or something like that, uh, working on the production quality. Appreciate your feedback. Sorry for obsessing about that at the beginning of every video, but at first I didn't care at all, and now I realize that, like, oh, it's sort of much nicer to watch videos that look pretty. So I appreciate all the tips. Hopefully I'll figure that out eventually. But in any case, I sort of I want to talk about the topic of work. It's a topic I have a lot of things to say about. Now, when I did the financial advice video, that was before dinner and before any beverages had been consumed. I'm now on my second beverage of the evening, which is a vodka and low-calorie cranberry cherry ocean spray cranberry mix. Very delicious. Uh, but that guarantees that all of the inhibitions are removed. And I feel like there's a lot of things in my brain that are all connected about the idea of work and the economy. And, well, there's a lot there. And I want to share it. And uh, I actually, I really believe that, you know, alcohol is not a bad thing when consumed in moderation. And it's a social lubricant and it's a mental lubricant and kids don't drink underage. Your brain has not developed to the point where you can handle ingesting that alcohol. But I think that, you know, there's lots of things in nature and in chemistry that when used in moderation can, can really help us enhance the power of our minds. And this is what I want to say about work. Well, I want to make at least two comments about how I see the evolution of the overall economy in the last hundred years. And then I want to sort of explain how I see that as painting the picture for an extremely hopeful future where work doesn't have to be the soul crushing drudgery that we see in movies like Office Space and that's portrayed in comics like Scott Adams Dilbert cartoons which are funny because they're true, because so many of us have experienced working in big bureaucracy, bureaucracies and the just soul crushing is the best word I can think of. It's uh, the, the stereotype of the business environment is an environment where, you know, uh, incentives are so misaligned that you have basically two choices. You either have to become completely cynical and political or and just play the game, you know, and knowing that it's not really genuine, or you just have to completely check out and not try. And I just don't believe it has to be that way. It doesn't need to be that way. Uh, I don't think it will be that way for very long. I think we're living in an interesting transitional period. And so this all connects to YouTube as well, and some of the comments that I've seen people give to Jennifer about how she, you know, is toying with viewing YouTube as a career and what does that mean and are you guys her boss and all that. And I just think it's all very interesting. But I want to start with what has changed about the economy in the last 100 years. And there's two, there's like, there's two things. There's two assumptions of what they call modern management theory, which was really developed 100 years ago by Frederick Winslow Taylor. I mean, not exclusively by Taylor, but he is credited as being the father of modern scientific management. And what he was focused on is how to max, essentially how to maximize the efficiency of production lines. If you think about the industrial economy of 100 years ago, the, the pace of innovation was such that, you know, new industries were being created like railroads and automotives, big industrial industries, but the pace of innovation was not so high that business models were changing like as fast as we see them change now. Uh, the Ford Motor, Motor Company is one of the, the greatest examples of one of these companies that thrived for decades in the industrial era. W with really, like the Model T, they produced it for over 20 years at one point. I think more than 50% of the cars on the road in America were Model Ts. They had an incredible market share. 
And there was a lot of innovation that went into the initial design of the Model T and the production line that they used to assemble it, to be sure. And, you know, very creative engineers worked on that problem. But, you know... Mm, Uh, very creative engineers worked on that problem, but they were able to dominate the market for 20 years with really just like one product and one significant innovation. And what really affected the profit margin of a company like Ford was how efficiently could they produce these cars and how consistently uh, could they achieve a certain quality standard. Efficiency and quality, consistency, were the absolute competitive imperatives of the industrial age once you had a business model or an idea that you thought could work. And so those were the things that, uh, that Taylor's approach were designed to maximize, and rightly so. There's a famous quote from Henry Ford where he says, <clears throat> excuse me, he says, how come every time I ask for a pair of hands, they come with a brain attached? And it, you know, that just reflects the attitude of the time. Henry Ford did not need his workers to be independent th thinkers. And in fact, if they were independent thinkers, that might actually diminish their productivity because they're not going to follow the standards that have been very meticulously laid out to make sure that each Model T comes off the production line the same. So there's two assumptions embedded in this approach to management. Now, Taylor's approach to management uh, involved uh, a hierarchical you know, control structure uh, a, and, uh, you know, centralization of information and standardization and supervision of activities. That Taylor's approach would be to study the production line and to figure out how to optimize the process and then to build a hierarchy, essentially a bureaucracy, that could ensure that those standards were met every time and also a, a bureaucracy that was able to aggregate information to the point where informed decisions could be made at a, the central location about whether to eat, increase or decrease production of this or that model, that sort of thing. There's two assumptions that this approach, it, that are embedded in the validity of this approach. And the first assumption is about the relative importance of innovation versus what you could call production or execution in the overall economy. That's what I was starting to try to get to. There's ideas out there about accelerating change. Um, there's uh, like in Metcalfe's laws. There's Moore's law. So Moore's law is not really a law. It's a rule of thumb or an observation about the evolution of computing power that says basically that the, the, the computing power you can get out of a given like number of microprocessors or something like that, or maybe it's the cost. The computing power doubles every 18 months is the idea. The cost of, you know, a one gigahertz processor halves every 18 months, something like that. And that's roughly, it's, it's amazing that that's actually held for 50 or 60 years. So there's this idea of exponentially increasing change. And so there was some inflection point, and I don't know, maybe we hit it in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. I don't know when we hit it, but we weren't there in the 20s. In the 20s, we didn't have personal computers yet. I don't know when they developed the first microprocessor, the Babbage computer, Charlie Babbage, I don't know. Around the turn of the century, sometime, I don't know. But this was not a big part of the economy, computing. The pace of innovation was sufficiently slow that, that just executing is what mattered and what could sustain a business with its competitive advantage for decades and decades. But as each innovation increases our ability to develop the next innovation, the relative importance of innovation in the economy and for any given business increases and increases and increases more. And the way I like to say it is that the half-life of a business model is ever decreasing. If we think of the Ford production line and even the Model T as their business model, and for how long can you operate with that business model before someone undercuts you, comes up with a better way to do it, a more efficient way, or a much more valuable alternative for consumers in your market? Uh, how long is it going to last? The amount of time that it's going to last is decreasing and decreasing. If you're in an industry where your business model has not already been completely upended and reinvented by the internet, uh, it's about to be. 
And if your industry has already been reinvented by the internet, well, it's about to happen again very soon. And I think that most businesses just, they completely miss. They might observe this trend, but they don't understand the significance of how that trend impacts the assumptions that are embedded into their management practices. And, you know, coincidentally or, or whatever, in the, in the 50s and 60s and 70s is when psychologists really began to understand more about what makes human creativity happen. And they've come to understand that it has nothing to do with what makes efficiency on the production line happen. When Henry Ford is saying, give me a pair of hands without a brain, he's saying he needs someone to be a cog in his assembly line, to turn the same screw in the same direction all day every day, something to that effect. Uh, if you pay someone per widget, you pay me per hour, you pay me per unit of production, and then you say you'll pay me more per unit, you know, it, that can possibly motivate me to, to be more productive, right? Creativity doesn't work that way at all. Uh, it, ju it just, it does, you cannot turn creativity on and off like a light switch. Uh, one of my favorite models for thinking about um, what makes creativity happen is Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is one of these things that was developed in, in the 50s or 60s. And so Maslow's hierarchy of needs is like four or five or six levels. It's this pyramid of your kind of your base needs are just about survival. You need food and water and shelter. And then above that is just kind of like psychological safety. And above that is kind of feeling included and valued. And then at the highest level is what they call self-actualization. And that's where creativity is found. It's only after you meet all of these lower order needs and you get to the level of self-actualization that you, that you maximize or actualize your true creative potential as a human being. And none of the modern scientific management techniques, none of the, the bureaucracy and the hierarchy of the Taylor approach are designed to account for that. It's just not part of the equation. And the other thing that has changed so massively over the last hundred years is the cost of sharing information. That's another assumption embedded in the, the Taylor approach to management, is the idea that the only way for the management of a company to make informed resource allocation decisions is for there to be an aggregation of information to a centralized decision maker. This was actually true 100 years ago because it was so expensive to share information. You could not possibly push all of the information to every single node of the organization such that people on the front lines could make informed decisions. What do I mean by that? Uh, an example perhaps will help. Uh, Whole Foods, some of you guys have heard me talk about Whole Foods before. John Mackey is sort of a hero of mine in terms of being an entrepreneur and a philosopher of capitalism and free markets. Uh, I think the guy's absolutely brilliant. And what I've read about what they do at Whole Foods is very different from this, the kind of typical approach in the food retailing business. Your typical nationwide supermarket chain has some kind of centralized purchasing division and they negotiate deals with suppliers and they set the pricing in the stores and they determine what's going to be on their shelves and, the, and those decisions are, you know, are, are, are made at a, at a central level and apply to a, the, the whole nation or a very broad, uh, very broad geographies. And Whole Foods takes a very different approach. Whole Foods, for Whole Foods, the unit of organization of the company is not the store, it's, a, it's the team within the store. So they have teams that are responsible, I can't remember how many, seven, eight, nine, ten, something like that, divisions within each store. Uh, the produce division, you know, the, the meat counter, the dairy, the, the bakery, uh, each of those has their own team that's responsible for their P&L for that division. They're actually evaluated every two weeks based on quite a few different metrics about their profitability compared to other divisions at other stores. And uh, they even get, they get bonuses based on those metrics, from what I understand, on a, on a, bi on a bi monthly basis, semi -mo on a semi-monthly basis. Uh, but in any case, what's amazing is that at Whole Foods, they allow the people on the front lines, right? So that the front lines means the people in the store.
that are actually responsible for stocking the food cases. They decide what they're going to stock. And they have control over how they're going to price it. They have control over what they're going to buy from their suppliers and when. That's uncommon. Much more typical is that people far away from the front lines, people at the central purchasing managing office, they make those decisions. And historically, it would only be the people in that office that could get all of the sales reports from all of the stores to be able to see the trends, to be able to make a good decision about, oh, well, consumer preferences are obviously, you know, moving towards gluten-free stuff. Let's stock a lot more of that. That wasn't true 100 years ago, whatever the trend was. But today, Whole Foods gives access to the database of what's selling in which store and what quantity to everybody, right? The modern information technology allows them to build a database and for virtually no additional cost share it with everyone in the company. And that was not true <laughs> when these management techniques were created. It was prohibitively expensive to share information in that way. So these two things, the idea that the cost of information has decreased dramatically and the idea that the relative importance of innovation in the economy has increased dramatically, they completely undermine every assumption that, that modern management theory is based on and that those are the theories that are still dominant in guiding the way most companies operate uh, across the world as far as I can tell. There's certainly exceptions. I mean, there's a lot of exceptions, but that doesn't change the that doesn't change the fact that by and large companies are being are slow to make this change. Now YouTube I think is just is an incredible example of this. Jennifer has realized that what she does is she's an original content creator, right? Creator. That's innovation. That's creativity. That's not execution um, like turning this a screw in the same direction on an assembly line every day. And what YouTube has done by decreasing the cost of sharing information. It's, YouTube has, um, what are they called? The, YouTube has lowered the barriers to entry into the industry of original content creation such that however many people are on YouTube now and everywhere across the internet, you know, it's orders and orders and orders of magnitude more people that are able to create content and generate revenue by sharing it with others than could 50 years ago when you had to spend money to get studio time and get, you know, there was only TV or the radios or pay to have records produced or whatever it was. The frictions are so much lower now. And the pace of innovation is so much higher that it's, innovation is really the only high value add job left. I believe that innovation is something that everyone can do. I don't think that all right, so. All right, so that was a long rant. Now we're going to have a drink and see what the next thought is. So I wanted to get at I wanted to get at this idea that Okay, here's what here's where I wanted to get. There's a Warren Buffett quote. I've heard this quote a few different places now. I happened to read it in a book this morning called Now Discover Your Strengths. But I've heard Buffett talk about this in the series on YouTube uh, where he and Bill Gates, if you, if you search on YouTube, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, back to school, then you'll get this series of Q&A that they did at some college in the States where students were able to ask them questions. And both Gates and Buffett were asked the question, what's the most valuable advice you ever got or what's the best advice you ever got? And Bill Gates actually said that some of the best advice he ever got was from Buffett. And it was about saying no. And they early on when those guys were getting to know each other, I guess they compared their calendars. And, you know, Bill Gates has back-to-back -back meetings, 10 hours a day, 8 days a week, you know, as, as you can imagine. Uh, the guy had a pretty crazy life. And you open Warren Buffett's planning group, planning book, and you'd think he's a pretty busy guy, but no. There's like nothing in there. It's like nothing. There's almost nothing in his planning book. And Bill Gates was astonished and Warren Buffett goes, you know, I'm, I'm good at allocating capital. That's what I do. So I read a lot and I make capital allocation decisions. I don't go to meetings if they don't align with what I really love and what I feel like I'm really good at. 
And so that's Buffett's advice was, do what you love. Now, I mean, it's great. So it's easy for to hear a billionaire sit there and say, yeah, do what you love. Sure, okay. Well, I love playing golf. No one's going to pay me to play golf. So, you know, is my family going to end up on the streets because I took your advice, Warren Buffett? But what I believe is that in the economy of the future, with the level of innovation and the increases in productivity that we're having, more and more there's opportunity for all of us to do what we love and to, to get paid for it. Now, of course there's a balance there, right? Like Warren Buffett loves allocating capital, but if he was bad at it, he would have lost all his money a long time ago. It happens that he loves it and he's good at it and it's valuable in the economy. So there is, it's not quite that simple, right? You have to find that trifecta of, you have to love it, you have to be good at it, and it has to be valuable to someone else. But the conventional wisdom that we have about work is that it has to be valuable to someone else. And there's so few things that are valuable to someone else that you are never gonna find something that you love being good at, which is also valuable to someone else. And I just, I just believe that uh, it's time to stop thinking that way. I know that it's not immediately true for everyone across the world and the universe like that. Just because we think that way doesn't immediately make it a reality. But thinking that way does immediately make it more possible than it would have been otherwise. So I think that it's a very good challenge and a very good exercise to try and think that way. And... You know, my confession is to being a lucky son of a gun who was in the right place at the right time to make a bunch of money. And now my wife and I really are in a place where we can look at that and we can say, I only want to do things if I love them. And my, so some of you guys know that I'm working on a startup company and I don't really want to talk about it too much on, on YouTube because... My tendency is just to be like radically and obscenely transparent and I know that's not always the most prudent business thing to do and so I have to kind of keep a bifurcation of business and YouTube for the moment to make sure I don't do anything dumb. But what I do want to share is my personal kind of my aspiration for my company and you know, I've shared this with the people in the firm in videos that I've produced for them. But I just believe that everyone should have a job like that. Uh, I believe that everyone should have a job that allows them to achieve self-actualization. And I think that it's possible today. Uh, it's, it's obviously not possible this millisecond. It's not in this universe. It's not going to happen tomorrow. But there's nothing about the state of the universe today that makes it impossible. We just have to start working towards it. We have to start thinking differently about what we value and what makes business work. And I think that... There's a lot of people like, they're like John Mackey. I think the guys at like Zappos really get this. There's this guy, Gary Hamill, uh, who's written a book called The End of Management, who I think really gets it. I mentioned in some of the comments on one of the videos, the Management Innovation Exchange, if you Google that, is a great website of these management mavericks who are trying to, to create um, different kinds of companies. W.L. Gore is an amazing example of this kind of company. If any of you guys have Gore-Tex uh, wind or water resistant jackets, uh, that Gore-Tex material was developed at W.L. Gore uh, through their very, um, had a very novel approach to organization. The idea at W.L. Gore is that uh, no one tells you what to do. You get to pick what you want to work on. Leaders within that organization are leaders because other people have chosen to follow them, not because they were appointed by management. Now, that doesn't mean that the shareholders aren't in control of the company. There is some top-down control, but they have a philosophy and approach that makes sure that there's a lot of bottom-up influence. And for big, important things like how to pick a new CEO, well, I know that when they did that a few years ago, their approach involved having the board of directors whittle down the list to you know uh, a small number of candidates that they thought would be acceptable and then allowing the employees to vote on who they wanted or maybe they did it the other way around and the employees voted and then like the top three people were the folks that the board got to pick from can't remember exactly what the approach was I my takeaway though is that there's so many ways to develop 
decision making processes that balance top up and bottom down. And we're only beginning to scratch the surface of what's possible with that sort of thing. And when we do, I believe that we're going to unlock the potential for so much value to be created just by people doing what they love. And I think that there's enough diversity in human talent and in, in, in human preferences that there's someone that can get joy out of every job. And there is a level of service in every job. Like, you know, I don't want to pick on any job, but there's lots of jobs that I wouldn't want to do inherently. But I love the idea of being able to make someone else happy. I love the idea of being of value to someone else. And even if you can't do your favorite thing in the world as your job, if you can have dignity in your job, if you can be allowed the autonomy to do your job the way you think is best, and to be evaluated based on whether you actually satisfy the need of the person that you're trying to satisfy and not some ridiculous, messed up bureaucracy that has perverted incentives that have nothing to do with ostensibly the, the service role you're supposed to be providing. Um, I, I just, I think that that can be extremely fulfilling and there's a path there to, to just a completely different world. And, and like I said, I get a, I, YouTube is that. I think, uh, you know, I've been getting into Reddit lately. Um, if you guys don't know about Reddit, it's another, it's a social site. It started as a news site. I don't know exactly how to classify it now, but all the guys on Reddit are, they're, they're, they're very anti-corporate, right? They're very suspicious of anyone promoting their blog or making any money. On Reddit, you get karma. People give you upvotes and they, you get what's called karma, which is not worth money, but it gives you status within the Reddit community. And some of the Redditors are very, like, I, I don't know if snobby is the right word, but they think that doing things for karma is better than doing things for profit. And so they would frown upon people monetizing their videos on YouTube and getting paid for the clicks of the ads next to it that's somehow less pure of a motivation to express yourself than to just do it on Reddit. And I, I love Reddit, but I really just don't agree with that. I think the YouTube model is freaking amazing. I think it's absolutely brilliant that people like Jennifer and me and whoever else can earn a little money putting videos out there and that advertisers can find a way to get their message in front of the kind of people that they want to get their message in from. And it's something as minimally invasive as a five second ad that I can click away if I don't want to watch it. I mean, I, I just think it's a beautiful model and that the fact that YouTube gets a billion or two unique hits a month is, you know, obviously evidence that it works. So I think making money is a good thing. And I think being yourself is a good thing. And part of where I'm going with this is, I love, I love the feedback I've gotten from the YouTube community since my first video, which I scripted and you know tried to be perfect. And you guys were like, just talk, just be yourself, just be authentic. And I, I get that. I, I heard you. I get it. That and I love that about the YouTube, uh, the community, the appreciation of authenticity. At the same time. As soon as I started making videos, I started watching my view count, you know, and I'm a trader. So like I'm used to looking at the scoreboard. That's my mentality. And I, it, I have to make an effort not to judge each video based on how many views it's got or how much, what my AdSense analytics say for what the monetization revenue was. And I just, those is a conflict, right? Am I going to do a video that I think you guys want or am I going to do a video that I want? You know, I know Jennifer's advice to people getting started has been just do what you love and be passionate about it and people will come along. But the, these things, it sounds like opposites, but they're not. They're, pole, they're poles, they're opposites that need each other. Um, it's not disingenuous to say, I want to be myself, but which version of me would you guys like to see? I don't think that's disingenuous at all. I'm not homogenous. There's lots of pieces of me. I show up differently on video than I do in person, and I'll show up differently from one video to another. And now that I've gotten into this, I like I really love the idea of trying to figure out how can I how can I create a video that'll get 100,000 views. I think that's a cool goal. I know that in order to do it, I have to channel my authentic self somehow. But which of the myriad million ways 
to channel my authentic self is going to be the way to do it. Only you guys can tell me. And I believe that that kind of communication and dialogue, which is possible with today's information technology, which was not possible before, is the major difference maker in how the pace of innovation can massively accelerate, the pace of economic growth can massively accelerate, and the opportunity for people to create value and be successful just by being themselves can massively accelerate because through that efficient and effective communication, we can get to know each other so well and we can dial in those spots where my greatest talent is the greatest good for the greatest number. So that was a pretty long ramble. Like I said, it's, I'm a beverage or two in. I think that might be a place to, uh, to sign off. Uh, I hope some of you found that interesting. I really hope that you leave me some comments, whether you did or didn't, and share with me your feedback. And I'm looking forward to creating more videos in the future. Thanks for watching.